very much indeed, uh, Brendan. And congratulations on the success of uh, this institute that you set up um, some, uh, I suppose, 25 years ago now almost, um, which has gone every visiting dignitary in the world comes to, uh, comes to here. So, um, and, and, and thank you for affording me this opportunity uh, to speak on, on China's uh, 12th uh, five-year plan. Um, and, you know, I want to commend everybody uh, on the, uh, you know, the study that this needs, how important it is to us, even here in, in Little Ireland. Um, and I can hardly think of any subject as important for a think tank devoted to strategy policy development uh, as the Institute of International and European Affairs is, uh, than, <coughs> than the, the current round of lectures which uh, is now being initiated on China and the decade ahead. For my subject, I've chosen the 12th five-year plan for the period 2011 uh, to 2015, which was adopted by the National People's Congress in March of this year. Actually, I was in uh, Beijing uh, the week they held that Congress. And for my theme, I want to develop the proposition that China is now setting uh, the global agenda in key economic areas. This is the third time in three years uh, that I've addressed the Institute on China's new role in the world. Uh, the first uh, lecture was given because I was absolutely fascinated by China's acquisition of huge uh, amounts of, of natural gas, oil and, and coal around the world. And it was uh, systematically uh, restructuring uh, the whole feed arrangements in the world and was, was, was putting its hands around enormous quantities of these resources. And these agreements were so vast uh, and so long-lasting and so important in world historical terms that I thought, yes, I, I need to tell some people about this because um, these are limited resources. And they're not available for everybody uh, in the quantities that, that we would all like them. And we're now facing, as you know, the peak of oil. Um, but as a book I read recently, it's not just the peak of oil, it's the peak of everything else as well. In the paper, in that first paper, I suggested uh, that the construction of this network was proof not only of Chinese grand design for its own economic development, but also for the long-term planning perspective, uh, which was superior to the mindset uh, that existed then and still exists in the Western world. Uh, it was interesting that the main reaction came from within China itself, uh, indeed from the top uh, of one of China's leading think tanks, uh, the China Institute for International and Strategic Studies in Beijing, uh, which led to its chairman, General Professor Jiang Guang Kai, uh, speaking here at this institute uh, in May uh, 2008. The second paper, some 18 months later, elaborated further on Chinese grand design and focused on the inevitability of Chinese, Chinese rise to world leadership uh, by the midpoint of this century. Uh, the title of that lecture said it all, China leading the world again. Um, and, you know, China has, has led, had led the world all the time in, in its history until about the uh, 1800, uh, which was, you know, it's, it's fascinating to read about the old the old China with its incredibly stable culture, its respect for the family, um, its respect for civil authority, uh, the codification of all this under the, uh, under the, the rules of Confucius. Um, you don't actually find too many people uh, leaving China and not going back to it. I mean, a lot of people, everybody who, who was born and brought up there seems to want to go back there. Um, and it seemed to me that China is, is actually now on the point of becoming uh, the world leader, and I'd like to, and we tried to explore in that second paper what the implications uh, meant. As before, the main response came from within China, notably this time from within the business community. Uh, this time the paper uh, had been translated into Chinese uh, and was made available on the web, and uh, we circulated from my own company, Mainstream Renewable Power, there. And it seems to me, <coughs> a year and a half later, that's essential to ask if the Chinese miracle uh, is self-sustaining, and if China uh, is still set on the path uh, towards uh, global leadership uh, by mid-century. And I say this for two reasons. Firstly, we've had an unprecedented financial crisis in the world. And has China uh, come through that, and, and what effect has it had on China? Secondly, there's a unique chance to assess China's future economic prospects because of the latest five-year plan uh, that's just been published. And these plans, of which this is the 12th, are profoundly significant. They analyse the past and set down strategies and targets for the future. And if read carefully and with proper respect 
uh, for Chinese thought processes and mode of expression can offer a true guide as to what is being planned and what's very likely to happen. Uh, but there's a problem. Uh, the difficulty for me, or anybody else for that matter, in speaking on China is to remain credible uh, because the use of superlatives is unavoidable um, and this automatically provokes a reaction of disbelief among Western audiences. After all, we're dealing with the largest population in the world, the oldest continual culture in existence, the world's fastest growing economy, and the greatest social transformation in history. And when we try to relate all this to what we know uh, as normality in the West, we understand, understandably have a problem in terms of, of scale and of proportion. For Irish people, we're dealing with a society, a society uh, 335 times larger uh, than we are. And so this gives us some scale as to the challenges um, that we're about to discuss. As for history, the sense of perspective is no less difficult. Here is a society that once led the world in every conceivable way. Gunpowder, the printing press, uh, every single aspect of scientific and human endeavor uh, was led by China until, as I said, uh, 1800. And it then fell from, from well, it actually chose for some reason, which I haven't quite got to the bottom of China, took itself out of the world. In fact, probably from about 1450, it, it decided it was hardening itself around a feudal type society. Um, and it, was, it has since been patronized, colonized, uh, abused and exploited by various um, powers uh, who went in there to try and, 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 and grab a slice of, of Chinese action. Yet for the past 60 years, this great civilization has recovered its independence, restored its dignity, revived its economy, and re-emerged uh, on the world stage to the amazement of those who had written it out of history. Not only that, it is engaged in the greatest social transformation. Um, already, I think, it's probably moved 450 million people uh, into cities. Uh, that means it's actually created 450 million jobs, or thereabouts, uh, since this transformation began. This isn't fantasy, because we can go there and see for yourself. It's fact. A country that was devastated by war, famine and disease, whose standard of living was among the lowest in the world, uh, which was sunk in despair, is being transformed into a, a modernised, urbanised society, which will soon lead the world. Uh, for over 30 years, it has recorded an annual growth rate of 8% per annum, without rampant inflation, uh, an achievement that every Western economist says is actually quite impossible to do. But again, it's been done. Uh, since 1980, it has, according to the World Bank, uh, grown its economy by 1,500%, whereas the US has grown by 120 and Ireland by 235%. It has engineered the greatest ever migration in history uh, from the countryside to new cities. As I said, during the 30-year the uh, industrialization process, 420 million farmers left their farms and settled in urban China. China built more roads, railways, power and gas grids, schools, houses and hospitals than the rest of the world put together uh, during this period. Every year it builds a power system the size of Germany's, and it keeps on doing this every year. It has maintained order and social cohesion while transforming its society at a speed never previously experienced in world history. I think you will agree that in these circumstances it's reasonable to ask if all, all of this progress can be maintained if China can survive uh, the global financial crisis as well as domestic difficulties, and if the targets that it set itself can be achieved. As it happens, the plan answers these questions. The global financial crisis did not unduly affect China or knock it off its growth path. Domestic challenges have been met, and hence China is still on track for global leadership. I accept that these are, are pretty weighty conclusions, uh, but reference to the existence of a plan gives us a clue as to why I believe China will succeed in becoming uh, the world's superpower by the middle part of this century. China has been consciously developed on the basis of long-term, consciously directed, coherent, mutually reinforcing policies in which progress is iterative, cumulative and sequenced in the right order. The 12th five-year plan has, if you will pardon a statement of the obvious, been preceded by 11 others. The process beginning in 1953 in short, Chinese progress has been uh, over half a century in the making, remembering that 
the country was, was unified and, and set up as a new republic in 1949. So it's not an overnight success or, a, or one of these miracles that we read about. It's been done uh, by conscious design. Chinese planning represents the greatest ever exercise in organizing the collective intelligence of a people, both in terms of the length of time involved and the numbers of people engaged. 57 years uh, and one point, well, 1,300 1, million over that period. The current population of China, according to the latest census, is 1.341 million people. It's also being put together in a society based on meritocracy, a phenomenon that goes deep into the history of China is the only um, instance in the world that I know of, of a country that's been run uh, by, on, on the basis of a meritocracy and not on the basis of, of who your parents were um, in, in, in the history of this planet. The use of planning, of course, is no guarantee of success, uh, as the Soviet uh, experience confirms. But it's noteworthy that many of the top performing economies in the world uh, do a hell of a lot of planning. Um, and, of course, it's a sine qua non in business. If you don't plan, you don't exist. But in the case of China, the five-year plans are merely steps on a longer journey, stretching over the generations, an approach that's in keeping with China's unique history as a culture stretching back over 5,000 years of continuous existence. As of now, they are at the midpoint of a journey which began in the 1950s, and uh, which is, uh, um, you know, should conclude this phase somewhere around 2050. The broad strategic objectives for the journey are clearly stated by the Chinese leadership in the three steps uh, to development strategy uh, from the 1980s. Step one was to double the GNP uh, and ensure that people had enough food and clothing. Uh, that was achieved by the end of the 80s. Step two was to quadruple the uh, 1980 uh, G GNP by the end of the 20th century. This was achieved uh, by 1995, uh, obviously five years ahead of schedule. And step three was to increase the per capita GNP <coughs> to the level of medium developed economy uh, by the mid uh, 21st century. At that point, the Chinese people uh, will be fairly well off and modernization will have been basically realized. And it can be added at that point, China will be by far the biggest economy in the world. And so this places the 12th five year plan in a, <coughs> in a, in a, in a modern historical perspective. Given that the growth rate of 8% per annum has been achieved for the past uh, 30 years and that the 12th five-year plan is dedicated to maintaining the general growth level, it can be for forecast that step three will actually be achieved ahead of schedule, and that's my expectation. As is appropriate in this society with a strong engineering ethos among its leadership, something I could recommend, Chairman, to, to many other societies, uh, the process of transforming China from a feudal to a modern society is being planned over the long term in a sequence of phases which mutually reinforces each other. For the first 30 years, agriculture, industry and commerce were all controlled by the state. The variety, quantity and prices in every sphere of the economy were fixed by the central planners, which was very much in accordance with uh, Soviet practice. But this system sapped vitality uh, from the economy and limited its growth, which the Chinese began to realise. The leadership then experimented with incentives and in 1992 laid down the main principles of economic restructuring in which private enterprise began to emerge. Certain lead groups and geographic areas were encouraged to become rich first. And, and this is a decision that takes great courage by a leadership because unless you manage it properly, you create such social disparities that the whole thing could fall apart, but that hasn't happened. Shortly afterwards, the leadership stressed the importance of the private sector and profitability was encouraged. As a result, a socialist market uh, began to emerge with a defined role in the allocation of resources, which is precisely what markets are supposed to do. According to the previous five-year plan, China was to have had a relatively complete socialist market economy by the beginning of this decade and was to be comparatively mature by 2020. And this is where the 12th five-year plan comes in. It describes the current market system as socialism with Chinese characteristics. And I interpret this as meaning that two parallel markets, uh, one controlled and the other free, will coexist side by side in a framework determined by the government. 
It sets the long-term goals for society and remains, the government that is, remains responsible for macroeconomic management and building the physical infrastructure. In the controlled market, it develops key industries and services, but in the free market, uh, private companies have an ever-increasing role and do play an ever-increasing role in China. In short, a dual economy is emerging and the plan provides for substantial progress in that direction. Some commentators have expressed disappointment that this progress is not fast enough, but this overlooks what the Chinese call the scientific approach to economic development, and they will not be hurried lest they jeopardise what has already been achieved. This approach, as you have already detected, is based on trial and error, engaging in experimentation and applying the lessons that were gained from actual experience. These principles were clearly outlined by Dr. Justin uh, Yifu Lin in a series of lectures at, uh, given to Cambridge University uh, in 2007, and indeed repeated at, here at the Institute last year. He is the chief economist at the World Bank uh, and was founding director of the China Center for Economic Research at Beijing University. The lectures are worth taking into account because of his eminence as a policymaker. He refers to the political wisdom uh, derived from Chinese, uh, China's culture, which is enunciated in three guiding precepts, and I hope I had these pronunciations right, but I'm absolutely certain I won't. Shishi Kishi, which means finding truth from facts. Jai Fang Si Xuang, freeing one's mind from dogmatism. And Yushi Ju Jin, adapting to a changing environment. This political wisdom has been applied uh, to Chinese development processes, but what is striking is the bottom-up approach, uh, uh, whereby the facts are ascertained from experimentation at a local level and then applied nationally, the very reverse of what you would expect from a centrally planned economy. He describes this as the micro-first approach uh, and references the 1979 farm reform, which was, and I quote, initiated by farmers, sanctioned by the government, and introduced nationwide, only after its performance had been demonstrated. This reform resulted in dramatic increase in agricultural productivity and output growth. In fact, he goes on to say that, again, I quote, most other reforms in China were tried or experimented first with the initiatives of local entrepreneurs, local government, and were extended nationwide only after the initiative's success had been demonstrated. For many, this will be an unexpected insight into the origins of the so-called Chinese miracle. And for some, it will be a shock, because it's, it's so effective. What is intriguing about the, the lectures that he gave is that they are peppered with references, as you have heard, to incentives, initiatives, entrepreneurs, and resource allocation. And in other words, to the uh, power of the market and the importance of profit in that. This is not the vocabulary we expect from uh, socialist theorists uh, on the Mikhail Suslov line, but is one of the Chinese use as a is one of the Chinese use as a matter of course and gives us the uh, unexpected insight into what the Chinese call uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. It also suggests that market reforms will continue, and and but at a pace that does not endanger economic stability, and this is the balancing act that China has to accomplish and they do it well. They will continue at a pace they believe to be safe. This is the first and perhaps most important conclusion to be drawn from the plan. The reference to experimentation is important as a further insight into how the Chinese manage economic development, because it's obvious that the planning process itself has undergone profound changes over the past five decades. It has been transformed from a socialist-style top-down system to the largest policy consulting and research activity conducted anywhere in the world. This is a direct quote, this last sentence, from Dr. Hu, Dr. Hu An Gang, the re director of the Center for China Studies at the Tsinghua University, China's equivalent to MIT, and who incidentally is a strong advocate of the Green Revolution and the author of 40 books. He goes on to say that the process of formulating the 12th five-year plan is proof that China has formed its own democratic, institutionalized procedures for public decision-making. This is a startling claim, uh, but in my view, uh, the facts bear him out. The process by which the plan was put together is again startling in the way it has mobilized the intellectual resources of this huge society. 
According to Dr. Anne Gang, the consultation and decision-making process which led to the new plan consisted of 10 separate steps. I'm not going to go over the, the 10 in detail, but uh, if you look at just the, the first uh, uh, step, which was that they analysed, they began the whole process by analysing the 11th five-year plan. The Development Research Centre for the State Council and the World Bank office in Beijing all took part in this. This was complemented by an opinion survey conducted uh, by the State Information Centre and the National Bureau uh, of Statistics. The findings were communicated to the National Development and Reform Commission, which is at the very heart of the whole planning process. So, I mean, step, step two to ten, uh, there's no point in going over in detail, but let me say it went up to the government uh, with, with the research, the necessary research. It starts where all business starts with the planning, finding out what the customer wants, what the technology state is at, how are we doing, and it takes this feedback uh, from the people. And then it, 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 it basically, for the next year and a half, it travelled up and down the system in China, uh, being embraced, of course, from the very start uh, by uh, Wen Jiabao and, and Hu Jintao, uh, <coughs> and culminating, um, uh, indeed, in, in the meeting that happened in March, which was tremendously uh, significant. And I think for the first time, the whole world began to talk about um, the Chinese uh, five-year planning system. And, and these ten steps are really only a broad outline of a process, and it's clear there are many intermediate steps, but you, know, you, you, you begin to get the picture here of how this is happening, from the top down and from the bottom up, in a, in a, um, a dialogue of, of mutual respect, uh, and in, in, in a learning, as you don't know, as Stafford Beer might once have said. I believe the planning process is worthy of a, study, uh, of a study in its own right, and there are many lessons to be learned by any society wishing to mobilise itself in the face of challenge. Indeed, uh, we in Ireland could learn the values of mobilising all our intellectual resources uh, to solve our own national problems and of applying intelligence and reason uh, to the development of solutions. At this remove, let me say, there is indeed a prima facie case for claiming that the Chinese planning process is the most extensive and intensive ever conducted by any society at any time. At the very least, it should cause us to reassess what we mean by the term democracy. And it should prompt us to ask if this process is any less participative or legitimate than decision-making in Western democracies, where so much is decided by unelected bureaucracies and influenced by unaccountable pressure groups and lobbyists. In turning to the plan itself, I'm not going to list all of its targets and commitments, for they run into the hundreds. Rather, I'm going to try and focus on the strategic framework, select some key targets, identify what is new, assess the overall implications of the plan, and then offer uh, a couple of reflections on this. First of all, the strategic framework. At this stage in their long-term strategy, the Chinese are embarked on no less than five major revolutions, uh, all which are running in parallel. They are uh, industrialization, urbanization, marketization, internationalization, <coughs> and then a new one for me at any rate, but, but this is a direct translation of what it says, informationization. I think we all know what it means, we just haven't probably seen it stated like this before. All this is to be achieved while maintaining stable growth in per capita income, in what might be called a system of dynamic stability. This is difficult to achieve in engineering, and I imagine it must be much more difficult to achieve uh, with all the various interests in politics. But any good plan or the SWOT analysis on which, it, in which it's based must begin with the recognition not only of strengths but of weaknesses. Uh, that's discovery of truth from the facts, as Justin Yifu Lin has called it. In my own company, uh, those, those uh, will, will, when, when people are brought into the company, I usually point up to a sign on the wall which says, give me the facts. There's a quote from Tony O'Reilly, by the way. He says, give me the facts, just the facts. Facts are friendly. Um, and another one is, is a quote from, um, <coughs> what's his name? The founder of General Motors, which says, um, don't give me the good news, don't give me the bad news, give me the facts. Facts are friendly. And it's just amazing to see a society, uh, <coughs> you know, adopting that. Facts are sacred. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's why I, I think the Chinese plan is, is definitely uh, on, its, on, on its road to success. <coughs> 
It says the main weaknesses to be overcome are the imbalance between economic growth on the one hand and resources and the environment on the other. This turns out to be one of the key insights shaping the plan and leads China in the direction of the Green Revolution. Other major weaknesses are the imbalances between investment and consumption, large income disparities, an innovation deficit, and a gap between rural and urban development. It is admitted that there is a significant increase in social conflicts, as is, has to be inevitable. And this turns out to be another key insight into the choice of guiding principles which are outlined in the second chapter of the plan. The plan is a huge document. It hasn't all actually been translated uh, into, into our language. Um, so we're working with, with what we can, but we, we do get enough insights to see uh, what's really behind it and what's intended. The first guiding principle is familiar. The sentiments echo, echo some other great historical documents, whether it be the American Declaration of Independence, the French revolutionary motto of liberty, equality and fraternity, or the Communist Manifesto. The plan simply says, we should live up to the people's expectation to live a better life. It can't be any simpler or more honest than that. Later, the chapter goes on to say we should attach more importance to social welfare protection and enhance social justice. One paragraph stands out which is worth quoting in full in order to get the full flavour of the social philosophy running through the plan. The fundamental aim of economic transformation is to improve people's lives, which can only be achieved by improving the social welfare system, giving priority to job creation, providing equal public services to every citizen, and stepping up the reform of the income distribution system. We will unswervingly realise shared prosperity and bring the benefits to the people. Now, it seems to me that these sentiments accord in full with the political philosophy of most people in Europe, and it gives me great reassurance that the Chinese leadership is first and foremost focused on meeting the needs of its own people. The plan is neither expansionary or threatening, but in fact is based on the guiding principle that China will work with the international community to tackle global challenges and share the potential for development. I think this answers some of the fears that have been voiced about China becoming too successful. Uh, the main tools for macroeconomic management are outlined in Chapter 4 of the plan, devoted to policy directives, and at least six stand out uh, in their importance to the achievement of the grand plan. You have to balance growth and inflation. Everybody knows that if you don't look after inflation, um, particularly in rising, from rising property values, you stand, the, you stand the chance of destroying your society. Um, two, to expand domestic uh, demand to a point where the domestic market is one of the largest internationally. Increased urbanisation and additional employment will lead to growth in demand. It's been said over the last 30 years that the main engine for growth in the world was the American consumer. Well, having learned from that, the Chinese are implementing uh, something uh, along similar lines. Number three, to optimise the investment structure by clearly defining the scope of government activity and encouraging private investment uh, without overheating the construction sector. Promote industrial upgrading by innovation. They've identified, strangely as it seems to me at any rate, that innovation is a weakness of, their, uh, 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 of where they're at right now. Uh, I find that strange because they were such an innovative society uh, in times gone by. But nevertheless, they've identified this, that's the feedback they've got, and, and we have to accept that it's true and they're going to address this area. They have, they're going to, uh, in point five, incentivize energy conservation, which is an important pointer to the Green Revolution, and six, improve services. So they're becoming a thoroughly modern economy in every sense of the word. So much for the tools, but it's when we begin to look at the targets that we run into the credibility problems I mentioned at the outset. Uh, they're beyond anything with which we are familiar. First of all, the annual growth rate is set at 7%. Now, I have to say at this stage that it's, it's very difficult to understand what they mean by 7%. I know their economy was 2 trillion in 2001, and 10 years later, it was 6 trillion. I did some sums on that, uh, very basic sums, compound arithmetic, and I found out that that was an 18% growth a year. Now, if you discount inflation for that, and even allowing inflation at 6%, you still come up with 12% growth per annum. So when the Chinese commitment says to a 7% growth in GDP, 
that's, that, that alone is going to yield 40% over five years. I suspect that it's actually going to be much higher than that. We in Europe, of course, would be happy if we get, collectively that is, 10% uh, growth uh, in this current period we're in. And incidentally, a 7% growth, the economy will double uh, by, the, by the end of, of, of this 10-year period out to 2020. Secondly, 45 million new jobs are to be created in urban areas, and unemployment is to be kept at 5%. The minimum wage is to increase by at least 13%. Thirdly, 36 million uh, low-income apartments will be built in urban areas. I can tell you if any other nation in the world said they were going to do that, I'd put the salt cellar back in my pocket. Um, but when it's said in China, I know it's going to happen. And the total population, this incredible experiment that's been going on for a long time of trying to keep the population steady, uh, they're, they're going to try and keep it more or less constant, but admit that over the period it could grow by some 50 million. And that's more than the population of Spain. Fifthly, uh, 45,000 uh, kilometres express rail network and the 83,000 kilometre national road network will be completed. Urban rail networks in major cities, new ports, inland waterways and new airports are all to be constructed. Uh, the expenditure on R&D uh, is to be increased uh, to 2.2% uh, of GDP. Uh, at present it's way below uh, the international average. But, you know, they are going to build their own planes, they're going to lead the world in the development of electric vehicles, etc. And these are only a sample of the headline targets, but their selection serves one purpose. Uh, the success of the 11th plan and the target set for the 12th plan confirm that the long-term strategy is firmly on track, and it is eminently reasonable to project that China will lead the world again. This is true despite the difficulties caused by the global economic crisis. Um, but what about setting the, the, the global agenda, the theme that I have chosen? If we examine what's new in the plan, then I think there are three areas in which China will indeed determine the policy agenda for the rest of the world. Uh, each of them has profound uh, significance, and collectively they will determine the future, not only for, for their society, but for the rest of us as, as well. And they are combating climate change, stabilizing the international financial system, and three, organizing the rules for international trade. These are three big, big goals that could only be talked of by a, by a, a, a big society. In my view, the most important innovation in the plan is the explicit commitment uh, to combat climate change. It places China alongside Europe as a pioneer in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and creating a low-carbon society. This poses an immediate threat to the US leadership right across the global agenda. For as China gains credibility in cutting its emissions, and as the US loses standing because of its refusal to do likewise, then the moral authority passes to China, and China's authority, as a result, will grow within the international community. What we saw in Copenhagen is only an indication of what is to come. The plan combines climate change, resource management, and energy efficiency as a guiding principle designed to change the economic development model, and it needs changing. It goes on to put China in pole position by a commitment uh, to the development of the circular economy. Now, the concept of the circul circular economy is hardly known in the West, although it has been propagated by the German uh, chemist uh, Michael Baumgart and the American architect William McDonough in their book Cradle to Cradle. Uh, so far without much success except in the Netherlands. One simple way of defining the circular economy is to say that there be no waste and that everything will be reusable. The plan re re refers to resource reduction, recycling, remanufacturing, zero emissions, and popularizing the classic recycling economic model. Seven key areas are specified for this project, as they call it. They all recognize that resources are finite that they have to be husbanded before they run out, that we must change our methods of production and of consumption if we are to survive as a species. Uh, these are uh, complemented by comprehensive measures of, to control greenhouse gases. And these include the regulation of greenhouse gas emission sectors such as transportation and agriculture, as well as extending the national forests, taking countermeasures against uh, 
desertification and land petrification, and introducing a water conservation programme. There is talk of an emissions training system. When you step back from all this and rise above the detail, you see a holistic approach to protecting the ecosystem uh, from human activity. It seems to me that one implication of this total policy approach is that China will expect other countries to be no less responsible. Indeed, the plan states that China will launch wide-ranging international cooperation and actively participate in international negotiations. There's a heightened consciousness in the plan of the vulnerability of China to extreme uh, climate incidents, natural disasters and ecological degradation. And this is clearly impelling the Chinese towards uh, international cooperation on a principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. This prospect is either reassuring or ominous, depending on, on where you stand and how you look at it. It is reassure, reassuring if you're European. We've been trying to do this almost alone in the world uh, for the past 15 years. But it could be ominous if you're American, because differentiated responsibilities means that the US will have to do most in terms of greenhouse gas reductions and in cutting down on waste in a society where waste is a way of life. In fact, in the United States, uh, the average citizen consumes 36 pounds of resources each week. To make these 36 pounds of resources, 2,000 pounds are used and thrown away. So, to support uh, consumption in the United States, the vast bulk of everything that's touched is thrown away as waste. That's some gap uh, to, try and, to try and close. For my part, I think the future is more reassuring than I had uh, expected, because if the Chinese are as serious as they say they are, then they will have to address two issues which otherwise would cause serious concern. I refer to their use of coal and nuclear energy. The Chinese addiction to coal is as strong, every bit as strong, as is in the United States at a consumption of 3.6 billion tonnes a year. And there's reference in the plan to clean and efficient coal-fired generating sets. Huge tautology, I say, but... Uh, and there's also a reference to shale gas, a very, another very dangerous phenomenon. The development of nuclear power on a safe and efficient basis is, is proposed. This was written, of course, before Fukushima Daiichi happened. So we all wait to see what happens. Uh, these three strategies are, uh, are, are, are completely incompatible. That is, you know, further uh, development of coal. If they were to achieve their plan, as uh, I saw it written in the plan, they'd go from... Uh, in the business as usual scenario, 3.6 billion tonnes a year to 7.9 billion tonnes being consumed by 2020. Uh, that's, been, that's been written. Um, shale gas is a, is a massive polluter, actually greater than coal. We can talk about all that later. And nuclear has its own challenges. Um, their inclusion in the plan is a reminder that nothing is perfect. And I suspect that as China starts setting the global agenda on climate change, and environmental sustainability, uh, that logic will prevail. China, in my view, will become the principal guardian uh, of the global ecosystem and will expect others to join as partners or at least to fall into line. Uh, there's going to be no easy escape routes for the unwilling or for the irresponsible. The second uh, arena in which uh, China is setting the global agenda is in the international financial uh, area. The plan gives this considerable attention for a variety of reasons. Because of its phenomenally high savings ratio, which is an integral part of the Chinese culture, as you all know, China has built enormous external reserves and is effectively financing the, the, uh, the big debtor nations, such as the United States. Furthermore, China is consciously pursuing a globalization strategy involving both foreign direct investment and outward investment for Chinese companies. For these reasons, it has more interest than anybody else in stable financial systems across the globe and for the ordinary relations between the great currencies of which the yuan or the renminbi uh, is, is now one. The plan commits China to actively participate in global economic governance and to the reform of the international financial uh, system. This means the Chinese intend to rationalise the international currency system. The plan states very clearly that China will actively participate in drafting and amending international regulations uh, and standards so as to increase its influence uh, in international economic and financial organisations. Presumably this means the IMF, the World Bank, 
uh, the World Trade Organization as well as others. It's an unavoidable law of international relations that the strong have more influence than the weak. And it is an inescapable law of economic behavior that a creditor dictates to a debtor. These laws are already in play, and the more China accumulates foreign reserves and acquires uh, more uh, foreign assets, the stronger its hand in determining how the international financial system is going to work. Just as uh, the UK had to give way to the United States at the end of, of World War II, so is the US now giving way to China in the wake of the astronomical deficits it continues to run and the implosion of Wall Street. In other words, there will probably be a new Bretton Woods, but it's going to be written in Beijing. This brings me to the third area in which China is setting the global agenda, and, that, and that's of international trade. The issues here are not so much traditional trade policy, such as dismantling protectionist barriers, but the looming menace of scarce resources and the inevitable competition, initially for oil, then for other fuels, and then for everything else. You know, there's seven billion of us now going to nine billion, and, you know, there's no uh, rule written by God or man which says that the resources out there have to keep on supplying us. In my opinion, this is the real big challenge that faces the world, how we're going to continue to live as a species on this planet. But it's great to see that the Chinese are actually have put this up in, in, in one of the three uh, cardinal pillars of, of how they see uh, their economy going forward and the management of these issues internationally. It has to be said that the Chinese are by far the best positioned for designing the rules for the contest ahead and of determining the outcome. First of all, they are equipping themselves with moral authority because of their climate change strategy. Secondly, they have acquired the necessary economic clout because of the successful planning system. And thirdly, they have developed an unparalleled network of alliances uh, with suppliers of energy and materials. Finally, they are a creditor nation uh, who is only getting richer and can, can dictate terms uh, to those uh, you know, who owe them money. It seems logical to conclude that China will indeed increase its influence in determining the rules of international trade, and it could be that the outcome will be irrational and beneficial all round. At the very least, I hope it will be consistent with the Chinese view of harmony and friendship. And, and let me remind my audience again, as I said, uh, I dwelt a lot on this in the first two, uh, first two lectures, China has never invaded anybody in three and a half thousand years of complete dominance. They did something that we in Europe took about seven or eight hundred years to find, that it's much easier and much more successful in the long run to trade with people than to go in and grab the resources and, and to kill them all. Uh, and, and this is wisdom uh, uh, written into the culture of, of China. If they don't, of course, continue to obey those rules, well, we're all in trouble because they will get all the resources. But I don't believe that that's their intention. Let me conclude with a number of, of reflections which I hope are consistent with the previous analysis. As I said earlier, the average per capita, annual per capita income in China is $4,000, although there are considerable disparities between regions, between city and country, and now between classes. To get to 10,000 per head is the long-term plan. But the jump from 4,000 to 10,000 is always regarded in these ways as a, as a particularly difficult thing to do. One development that might help is the change in the international model, whereby the emphasis is to be placed on domestic consumption and investment, as well as exports, while rapidly expanding services. It will also be helped by a plan to expand the cities by 360 million over the next three decades. And we have to reflect what, that, what that's all about. 360 million people are going to move, a further 360, from the countryside uh, into, into the cities. It is a fact that urbanization accelerates growth and then becomes the cause of greater growth in itself. So I think this mid-century goal that they've set themselves will actually easily be achieved and a lot, and, and, and a lot before uh, 2050. The danger, as I said earlier, is inflation. The constraint on growth is, is not only the growing scarcity of resources and the need to protect the environment, but also the limitations inherent in energy usage. I've not really mentioned energy up to now. Uh, I was keeping the good wine till last. Not a recommended practice, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the key fact here is that household energy use doubles with urbanization, according to the China Energy Group. This means that the elasticity of demand is driven not only by income, 
but far more significantly by a change in lifestyle. Since only 400 million, only 400 million, live in the eastern cities, there is still a long way to go in terms of increased energy usage. Now, the plan intends to offset some of the increase by cutting energy intensity by 16% over the next five years. But nonetheless, energy consumption is going to grow steadily. In fact, the, the elasticity is more than one. 1% 1 growth in GNP, um, according to the plan, actually means more than 1%. At their level of development, I remember when Ireland was, let's say, at a similar level in the 60s, uh, we had actually a 2 to 1. We had 1% 1 growth in GNP leading to a 2% growth in energy demand. So when China says it's going to um, cut energy intensity by 16%, well, I, I personally go and I'd love to see how they can do that. It's, it's, a, it's a really challenging thing to do. Recalling what I said about the use of coal and nuclear, and if the Chinese are to be true to their environment goals and emission targets, then the only way to meet the energy demand ahead is through renewables. As is always the case, this means wind and solar. Already the Chinese are installing more wind and solar than any other economy, and are tra transforming both sectors with exciting innovations. In my view, uh, they not only have the technological capacity to meet their energy and uh, needs from renewables, uh, but they have the resources as well. We've studied China intensively over the last seven or eight years, and there's plenty of wind and huge quantity of solar there to meet, to meet any of their uh, long-term energy goals. I know from first hand uh, that the Chinese turbine ma manufacturers can offer, and quite simply their products are the best in the world in terms of quality and price. Uh, and the same is true of solar, where they are really redefining the solar photovoltaic agenda. And I'm very happy and proud of that mainstream renewable power, my own company, has developed a close relationship with, with Goldwind, which is the second largest Chinese turbine manufacturer, and about uh, in, within, within the next two or three years, going to be the second largest in the world. Uh, we've put together a joint venture um, uh, with them, and we competed for uh, a contract in Illinois, which was incredibly competitive. I didn't think we could win it, uh, but we did. And we were, became the first Western company to deploy Chinese turbine technology uh, in the United States or in Europe. So I believe in the ability of China to install renewables on a scale required, bearing in mind some 70,000 megawatts of wind are foreseen under the plan. Uh, just, you know, what's a megawatt? Well. We've got about seven or 8,000 of them in Ireland. So these guys are going to build in the next uh, four and a half years 70,000 uh, megawatts. And they could do a lot better than that. I believe this figure will be, will, will be exceeded um, as the realities of, of nuclear and coal uh, strike home in a more meaningful way. I'm also convinced of, convinced of one other development. The plan encourages increased outward investment by Chinese companies under what they call the going out strategy. And this provides great opportunities for countries like Ireland to attract the very best of Chinese manufacturers to set up shop here and to start producing. I said in my second paper that the growth in Chinese personal incomes opened up huge export opportunities for Irish agricultural projects, especially in protein. And I called for a national strategy to realize that potential. I now add to that call, and I ask that the new government uh, develop a Chinese strategy, which would not only cover trade in both directions, uh, but would include investment both inward and outward. We have huge export market in renewable energy on our doorstep if we choose to develop it here in Ireland. Europe will need some one million megawatts, uh, between a million and a million and a half megawatts, by 2050 if we were to reach our greenhouse gas reduction targets of 80% and completely decarbonise the electricity sector. The other EU states cannot do that without importing renewable energy. And whereas we have the resources uh, and the right of legal access to that market, our Chinese friends have the technology and they also have the capital. We should put together the both of these. We could create a whole new energy sector here based on clean energy exports uh, into the wider European market. This is a challenge I hope the new government will meet with vision and enthusiasm. Uh, I would be only too willing, uh, as our company would, uh, to play a part in that. Uh, we visit Beijing, um, Barry and myself, later on this month, 
and let us hope we can, at that stage, sign a, a memorandum of understanding between one of the very large manufacturers there uh, who, who hopefully will set up here. Maybe not yet, but we, we're working towards that. And that brings me to my final conclusion. If we're going to go ahead <coughs> with the new strategic alliance with China, then we must deepen our knowledge of that unique civilization, And above all, we must learn to respect it. Respect is the founding value on which I have tried to build these companies that we've built over the last 15 years. We should make it a part of our national psyche and have it a, a, as part of the way we do business with others. Anything based on respect <coughs> actually can transcend culture. And we can, uh, and let us in particular in the West in general learn to pay China the respect it deserves and to base our relationships at all levels on the principles of equality and integrity. There's a book that, was, uh, that our chairman gave to me recently called The Scramble for China, and I think the byline said, how to keep China British. Um, that, uh, it, it, it made very interesting reading. It's, it's historical, but if you want to learn about man's inhumanity to man, it's one of the better texts. If we base our working relationships on mutual respect, then I foresee um, a great future in common. For our part, it requires us to respect Chinese tradition, their self-view, the role they assign to the family and their concepts of freedom and democracy. The plan has a great deal to say in Chapter 54 about the development of, and I quote, a political civilization with a people at its centre, and refers to the system of democracy, uh, democratic elections, democratic decision-making and management, democratic supervision according to the law, and the vision of a lawfully governed state. They are not only admirable sentences, but genuine aspirations. And here is a people attempting to, com to compress into two generations uh, what it took the West uh, 200 years uh, to accomplish. Their priority is to maintain social cohesion, to establish a balance between order on the one hand and freedom on the other. The balance differs over time and differs between societies at any given point in time. We have to respect where the Chinese have chosen uh, that this balance should rest and what's most appropriate to themselves. We have to respect this. In particular, we have to respect the way that China is advancing its own civilization towards what we would all recognize as commonly held goals and hope that we in the West will continue to do likewise. My last word is this, Mr. Chairman. I believe the 12th five-year plan to be one of the most important political documents of its time. It marks the consolidation of over 50 years of progress and sets out the plan for the next 50. It sets China on a new development strategy, provides global leadership in the fight against climate change, and lays down the foundations for a market economy based on the rule of law. It signifies the re-emergence of China on a world stage. And no matter how it is viewed, one thing is clear. The 12th five-year plan will enable China to set the global agenda. And we should all take note. Thank you very much.